Um, we thought we'd take you into something that we do a couple of times per month, give or take, and that is we go into the local primary schools and we tell Bible stories. We tell them in a way that is engaging to them. Uh, it's called Open the Book. And as it happens, the, the uh, account of Jesus that you've got in your service sheets is also an account that we literally um, read to the children last week. Before last week. Time. So, what we're going to do is, we always set the scene. At the moment, we're talking with them about Bible stories with a surprise. So that's the theme we're going through. And there is a real surprise in this story. And if Edda tells me which page we're on, oh, it's all bookmarked, then we can do that. And then we tell them, let's open the book, open the book and Edda will stand on this and Peter will make sure she can be heard. And we will hear the story. Do you want that to be closer? Yes. And I'll take it so that the cameras can see it as well. Everyone, can you see everyone? Can you see Edda, myself, and this? The props? Good. Not everyone can see the props because sadly it's slightly obscured. Maybe you Maureen, can, can you see the props? <laughs> you can. Brilliant. So, the story for today is The Widow's Coin. Don't read along in your service sheet. You'll be seriously confused. Just take it from us. This is the extended version. This is the long play version of this story. Jesus and his friends went to the temple. There was a line of people waiting to give their offering. They dropped their coins into a hole in the temple wall and the coins clattered into a money box underneath. Come and stand by the wall, said Jesus to his friends. I have some sums for you. If you listen closely, you can hear how many coins each person has given. Let's see who gives the most. The first person was a merchant. He looked very fine and very rich indeed. And as he dropped in the coins, Jesus' friends, you are now all Jesus' friends because you are, Jesus' friends counted them. So count along. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten coins, said one of Jesus' friends. Not bad, but I bet someone will do better. And someone did. The next person to arrive was a lawyer. He was even more finely robed and looked even richer. And Jesus' friends had to count more quickly as the coins went clattering down. We're going to go in steps of two till 20. Now this is higher maths now, I'm sorry. Here we go. Two, two four, four, six, six eight, eight, 10, 10 12, 10, 14, 16, 18, 20. 20 coins, said another of Jesus' friends. Twice as many as the first man. And then a third man was walking up to the money box. He looked very impressive. He was the richest of them all, and he was one of the religious leaders. Watch out for this one, Jesus whispered. The religious leaders like to send their coins rattling into the hole just as loudly as they can so that people will be impressed with what they give. And sure enough, that's exactly what he did. The religious leader reached into his money bag, scooped out a handful of coins. He looked around making sure that everyone could see and poured the coins into the hole with a flourish. They rattled down so quickly that Jesus' friends could hardly count them. We're going into steps of five until 40. Ready? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, Fifty. <laughs> wow. 
Now I've lost my place. Fifty! We give up! cried Jesus' friends. But at least we know the answer to your question. No one is going to give more than that man. And they turned to walk away. Wait a minute, said Jesus. There is one more person waiting. It was an old woman. It was a widow, dressed in black in mourning. She pulled two tiny coins out of her purse. I... I, I wish... I wish I could give more, she whispered. But I know, this is all I have. but this is really all I have. And she dropped the coins. One, two. Into the hole. Jesus looked at his friend. Anybody want to change your answer? He asked. No. The third man gave the most. Really? Said Jesus. But what about the woman? The woman? His friends chuckled. <laughs> the woman only put in two coins. We can count, you know. I know. But those were the only two coins she had. The others put in more coins, that is true. But they had plenty more in their pockets and in their money boxes back home. The woman, however, gave everything she had. Don't you see? It all adds up. The woman dropped in the fewest coins, but in the end, she gave the most of all. As Azita said, um, we started a new series called Hotel to Home last Sunday. And if you want to catch up on the first talk about Zacchaeus, which sort of sets the foundation, you can still do that on our YouTube channel. And we have a page on our website which has all the resources, including previous recordings on it. Just go to denneparish.church slash Hotel to home, one word, and that will be all on there. Today we're thinking about guest to investor, and when we were planning this series, a member of the leadership team said that reminded her uh, the title of John Lewis. And the reason is this, you will probably know that John Lewis is called the John Lewis Partnership. And the employees are actually together owning the company. So they are partners, not just employees. It's employee-owned. And you can see what a difference it makes, whether you just go to work of a morning to get your paycheck, or whether actually you're part of this setup, this company. You invest in it with everything you do. And so today we are thinking about how our faith in Jesus and our community as a Christian church can be less customer-consumer and more investor in God's work in our generation. Many people find it quite surprising uh, when they learn that the work of this church and all the other churches in our country is made entirely possible by the faithful giving of its members. We don't get any money from the government, there's no big pot sitting somewhere in the Church of England, but everything we do and we are, our services, our pastoral work, our outreach, all our groups, our maintenance of our buildings is made possible only through the faithful giving, the regular giving of all of you. And on a day like today when we talk about being investors in God's kingdom, I just want to say a big thank you. Without you, there would be no church work in Denham. It's as simple as that. And giving is part of our worship. <coughs> And so today, to symbolise that, to express that in our worship, uh, we are going to bring back the uh, collection bags as an offering. Not because it's something different, but it's part of 
us bringing all of ourselves into the presence of God and saying, thank you, God, for all your good gifts. So in the offertory hymn, the, key, the clue is in the name, the offertory hymn after the sermon. Uh, we're going to pass the bag through the rows and we're inviting you to add something in. Uh, if you're visiting today, please feel under no obligation to give. As always in this short series, you will find some suggested responses to this theme in your order of service. Take it away, take a chance to reflect and to think whether God is encouraging you to take one of those responses. And as I say, more responses, more resources and links on the responses are on the website. And so I think we're ready for our next reading, Azita. Do we, do we know who reads our next reading? And Kim is ready. Kim is reading our second reading. The second reading is coming from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I'm fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the world of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We just heard the words in our second reading. My God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come to you with empty hands and we pray that you would fill them again today. Amen. When we were first planning this series with the title Hotel to Home, I wasn't so sure whether this second part on our relationship with uh, money and material belongings was such a good idea in the middle of a cost of living crisis. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've come to the conclusion it is. Money has a peculiar kind of power, whether we have too little or whether we have too much. That's why it's so powerful when St. Paul says, if I have a little or if I have a lot, I can be happy with whatever I have. And so as we explore our relationship with Jesus and with his church in this theme of hotel to home, we cannot exclude our relationship with material possessions. Now, I wonder whether anyone here in this church online remembers George Best. Anyone remember George Best? Oh, look at the choir. <laughs> okay, it's half and half. My hunch is those of you who haven't put their hands up don't, are not interested in football mm. at all. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Well, I think uh, Josh Best was one of the star players of Manchester United quite a few years ago now. And I think it's fair to say that he often was more famous for his antics off the pitch than his skill on the pitch. One night after a, su a successful gambling session in a casino, 
The washed up Man Yu veteran stumbled back to his very posh hotel room, together with his girlfriend, a former Miss World, no less, and he ordered champagne. True story. When the waiter arrived with the champagne, he found Best lying in bed, surrounded by banknotes. George, said the waiter, where did it all go wrong? It's a brave thing to ask a football superstar. Where did it all go wrong? Where does it all go wrong when it comes to money and material possessions? Formula One legend Ayrton Senna said, money is a strange business. People who haven't got it want it strongly. People who have it are full of troubles. So that raises the question, does money make us happy? Answers on a postcard. I see some shaking heads, some quizzical heads. No nodding head, but you probably think what I'm going to say and you're not daring to nod your head. Does money make us happy? Well, interestingly, I read a long-term psychological study in preparation for this, which came to the conclusion that people who have got enough to make ends meet are happier than those who live in abject poverty. I think that needs to be said on this theme. But there comes a point where more money does not equal more happiness. In fact, the whole thing turns on its head and you're less happy if you get more and more and more. And they found something really interesting as well. And it is that increased money can lead to greater happiness, but not if it's spent on more things for ourselves. Those who teach the teachings of the Bible, take the teachings of the Bible seriously, could have told them. In Acts 20, the Apostle Paul says to his listeners, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Thank you for joining in. I hope you joined in online. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the article in Psychology Today sums up the findings of this study like this. Consumers aren't happy. Those with big hearts are. And instinctively that makes sense. So what's the attraction of money? I think money holds out at least four big promises and they are for safety, comfort, admiration and might. For well, the last one I could have chosen power but you'll see in a minute what I've, why I've chosen might instead. Safety, comfort, admiration, and might. Jesus had a lot to say about all these attractions of money. In fact, Jesus had to say more about money and material possessions than about most other topics. So let's take them in turn, starting with the first two, safety and comfort. Jesus tells the story of a rich farmer who had a bumper harvest and he decided I know what I'm going to do I'm going to build a new massive barn I'm going to store all my harvest in this barn and then I don't have to work anymore I can retire early I'm safe and I'm comfortable and we probably remember how the story of Jesus ends but God said to him you fool this very night your life will be demanded of you then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Sobering words. We know that we cannot control all aspects of our lives. We, money cannot make us completely safe and completely comfortable. That is not to say, by the way, that we shouldn't set a budget and budget well. But we should be wise stewards, that's for sure. But we shouldn't expect our ultimate safety and comfort from money and possessions. That's where it will go wrong. Thirdly, we've had safety, we've had comfort. Thirdly, admiration. In the reading of The Widow's Might that Edda and I performed to you just a few minutes ago, we saw rich people giving lots of money into the coffers of the temple and they made sure everyone saw what they were doing. But they get no praise from Jesus. No, says Jesus. The praise goes to a widow who gives two pennies. She's praised by him. 
In his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Jesus says, when you give, do not announce it with trumpets. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your heavenly Father will reward you. If we spend money to garner praise, it will corrupt us. And by the way, that is the reason that um, we have an arrangement with our treasurer, Mike, that I do not know what every single person in church is giving towards the work of the church. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. The praise goes to God. The admiration doesn't go to us. And finally, money can give us might and power. We know that. Money can make us powerful. But Jesus, in becoming a human being, did exactly the opposite. Made himself small and powerless for our sake. In Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul writes, have the same attitude as Jesus, who gave up his divine privileges, took up the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. Jesus made himself poor and powerless, to bring us home to God. Security, comfort, admiration, and might. Four promises that money ultimately cannot deliver on. And that's why the first letters of those four words spell I've heard it, don't be shy. Scam. That's why I didn't go for power. Scap isn't quite as good as scam. Security, comfort, admiration, might. It's a scam. It's the biggest money scam in history, in every generation. You know a scam when you see it, don't you? If it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Well, I'm afraid it is. If you see your ultimate security, comfort, admiration, and power in money, you are going down a scam. You are falling for it. It will not give us ultimate happiness, ultimate safety, ultimate influence and ultimate self-worth. Jesus recognized the power that money can exercise over us. That's why he called it mammon. You remember that from the King James Version probably. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I find that really fascinating because mammon is an Aramaic word, the language Jesus would have spoken in everyday conversations. But the compilers of the New Testament, which is in Greek, kept this Aramaic word in there. They did not translate it into the Greek word for money. And I think there's a reason for that. Mammon represents the principles of materialism. Mammon can become a rival god an idol. An idol is something that takes the place of God in our lives. And that leads us to the heart of the matter today. Money, which we hope will give us security, comfort, admiration and might, makes us think that we do not need God. That we are okay God, thank you very much. I've got control over my life. The Bible describes such people as lost. Zacchaeus, who we met in our service a week ago, was very rich and very lost. And the difference between the widow and the rich people in our Bible account earlier is simple this. The poor woman had to trust God. She never had enough to trust in her own riches. She never had the opportunity to fall for that scam. And I know that Edna and I in our own lives have experienced that our faith and trust in God has usually grown when our need for God was the greatest. So what is the antidote to the corrosive power of money? Well, here is a really good place to start. Give of your first fruits not of your leftovers. Give of your first fruits, not of your leftovers. 
Don't wait till the end of the month to see whether you've got a little bit left that you can give away. Instead, start giving away a portion of the money you receive straight away. And that is a declaration of trust in the God who loves us and cares for us. When the people of Israel were journeying through the wilderness, they had to trust in God's provision. There was no other way. And you will remember that they received manna from heaven, bread of heaven, bread of heaven. There's a good hymn there, isn't there? And the interesting thing is that this bread of heaven didn't keep. Some people say, ooh, you know, who knows whether this manna will fall tomorrow. We've got to make sure we have enough for tomorrow. So they kept it. They stored it. And the next morning, it was inedible. Give us this day our daily bread. And so it's fascinating that when they came to the end of the wilderness journeys, about to enter the promised land, the land where milk and honey flows, God gave them this instruction. I'll find it in a minute. Here it is. <laughs> Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. God said, you had to trust in me in the wilderness wanderings. I want you to continue to trust in me when you enter this rich land with a rich soil, with rich harvest. And as a sign of that, bring the first fruits of your harvest into the house of God. The first fruit is our declaration that we do not trust in things, but in the living God. The rich farmer in Jesus' parable never thought of that. He first thought about his needs, his safety, his comfort. Our relationships can be based on a contract model or on a covenant model. A covenant is a sacred, unconditional commitment, and we probably all know it from Christian marriage which we describe as a covenant. And in a Christian marriage service, the, the, the two people who are getting married make vows. You know the vows, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. It's a commitment no matter what. In contrast, a contract says, I'm going to stick to my side of the bargain if you stick to your side of the bargain. That's a contract. And some people live their lives like this. Some people treat other people like this. But it doesn't ultimately lead to fulfillment and to happiness. Hotel is about contract. I pay, you deliver. Home is about covenant. The only way in which we can be in a relationship with the living God is through the covenant that he makes with us. God is not into bargaining with us. He gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, so that all the prodigals can return home, become sons and daughters, not consumers or customers, but children, children of the living God. So when we give to the work of God, a lot more is at stake. Our own spiritual health is at stake. And again, let me give you a health warning here. You can only give what you have. We don't go into debt to give generously to the work of God. God is not asking us to do that. And we don't do it to show off or to impress. Everyone gives as they can. If you have never given in this first fruits way to God on a regular basis, I suggest that you start as small as your faith allows at the moment. And then, as your confidence grows in God's goodness, in God's provision, you can increase your giving. The important step is in starting, however small. In an email I sent out to everyone who's on our email list a couple of days ago, I asked, what will really count when we look back on our lives? What do you hope will be your legacy? And here are some of your answers. To have made a positive difference to other people's lives and touched their hearts. 
to trod God's earth lightly and never knowingly fail any brother or sister in need. To have invested in a positive Christian way in the lives of others. To have grown in my love for Jesus and to have made him known. Thank you for these responses. One of the people who responded to my email said, curiously, he'd never given that any thought. And he's about my age. What kind of legacy do I want to leave? Because life is busy and we live from day to day. And so it prodded him to think long term. In our second reading, Paul commends the Christians in Philippi for investing in God's kingdom work by supporting him as a missionary. And he emphasizes that they will be blessed by being <coughs> investors in God's work. That is the wonder of God's economy. When we give away, we will be happier for it. And the greatest gift anyone can receive is the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, to become his disciple, to come home to God our Father. That's what Zacchaeus <coughs> found. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave a mission to his disciples. He said, go and make followers of myself of all nations. Invite them to come home to God. And this mission, mission hasn't changed. God is still using normal people like you and me, and normal churches like us, to accomplish this mission through our prayers, through our witness, through our loving action, and through our giving. As we give thanks this week, all souls day, for all those followers of Jesus who have gone before us, as we are spurred on by their example, let's remember that now is our time. This is our race to run. And we can invest in God's kingdom work, here in Denham and around the world. Let's make our lives count in our generation. Our generation who needs the good news of Jesus as much as any before us. Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Amen. These last few days, I've uh, thought about how we can give a glimpse of someone who's run the race and has finished the race with deep trust in Jesus. And I've asked Kathy, Kathy McQueen, our church warden, whether she'd be happy just to share a little bit about her father. Kathy, I believe your father passed away just over a year ago. Two years. Two years ago. And very recently, you had a service of thanksgiving for him, which brought it back his life and your thanks for him. So, Kathy, share a little bit about what you have seen in your father. Thank you. Um, I've written it down because otherwise it's just a bit easier to say if I've got it written down. Um, so just a little bit of background about my dad. He was born in 1936. He was always inquisitive. He loved learning and as an adult trained to become a physics teacher. Growing up, he attended church, but it was only when he was filled with the Holy Spirit that his Christian faith moved from a general acquaintance with God to a personal living faith that changed the way he lived his life and interacted with other people. He believed in the power of prayer, forgiveness, and he practiced generosity. Um, I remember them often talking about giving the first fruits. Um, so um, any time they grew any runner beans or apples or anything like that, they would always practice that um, principle of giving away the first bit of their crop. As a naturally shy person, he learned to listen well to others. And with my mum, they both frequently offered hospitality. My dad died in August 2020, and I was privileged to journey with him on his last four days. There were many special moments in those few days, but the biggest lesson for me was that as Christians, we don't need to fear death. My dad was so certain of true life after death 
that when the consultant told him there wasn't anything else they could do for him, so where would he like to be? Quick as, my, quick as a flash, my dad just said, heaven. That was his immediate response. However, as a curious scientist, he still wanted to understand the how of death, and he hadn't found any decent answers from any of the nursing staff he asked, and he asked a lot of them. Um, a couple of days before he died, he was just lying quietly, and um, he just said, said, that's how you do it. That's really clever. And then he said with great joy, as if he'd actually, and I believe he did see, he said, he said, Oh, both my parents. And it was as if God, in his grace, just stooped down and gave my dad a glimpse into how we transition from this life into eternal life. And I now know that the physics of that process is really clever. It satisfied my dad. As a very bright physicist, he was content. He knew that actually that transition from life to eternal life was assured and the process is really clever. So in summary, my dad died as he had lived with a deep faith and trust in God. A few hours before he died, when the palliative consultant asked him how he was, my dad replied that he was praising the Lord and surrounded by angels. And that's just such a legacy and such a inspiration for for me and hopefully for you to live our lives so that at the end of our lives we can can also be praising god and know that we are surrounded by angels and are on that journey just a little glimmer just a breath away into eternal life thank you